State and local governments are where the action is on sustainability. They are responsible for local decision making that impacts the lives of residents. Since everyone lives within a local government of one form or another, it is worth examining the role of local governments to determine their overall role in advancing sustainability goals. They are often <clears throat> reacting to state, national, or international sustainability goals while working at the grassroots level to advocate for long-term sustainability of their region. However, it all starts with individual actions when it comes to buying into sustainability. We will take a look first at what you can do as an, as an individual to make your life a bit more sustainable. A common perception is that the actions of one person can do little in the face of a global problem. This, however, is not true and in that individual action plays a vital role in sustainable problem solving. Individuals contribute nearly one third of the greenhouse gases in the US in the form of fossil fuel burning and other energy related fuels. Therefore, it makes sense that if the individual makes the pollution, they can also find ways to reduce it and collectively would go a long way to reducing the pollutants being created. This is accomplished in small incremental steps that can act as a catalyst towards large scale transformational change. At first glance, it might appear that the goals and assumptions of marketing are incompatible with the goals and assumptions of sustainability. Traditional marketing encourages growth, promotes an endless quest for satisfying needs and wants, and seems to view resources as ever abundant. In contrast, a sustainability focus suggests that utilized resources can be renewed by mimicking the circular flows of resources in nature, and it respects the fact that the capacity of both the resources and the environment are limited. Although consumers report favorable attitudes towards pro-environmental behaviors, they often do not sub subsequently display sustainable actions. This discrepancy between what consumers say and do is arguably the biggest challenge for marketers, companies, public policymakers, and nonprofit organizations aiming to promote sustainable consumption. Thus, although consumer demand for sustainable options is certainly on the rise, for example, 66% of consumers, which of, of which 73% of millennials worldwide report being willing to pay extra for sustainable offerings, there is room for further encourage and support sustainable consumer behaviors. Unlike typical consumer decision making, which classically focuses on maximizing immediate benefits for the self, sustainable choices involve longer term benefits to other people and the natural world. Although broader marketing strategies can be useful in this domain, marketers also need a unique set of tools to promote sustainability. While acknowledging the drivers of change as important, there are still many barriers to making the shift to become a sustainable organization. Common barriers to change towards sustainability include competing priorities of managers, profit and growth prioritized over environment and human capital, organizational systems not up to managing the task, lack of capital to invest in new ways of design and managing operations, organizational culture not open to new ideas and innovation, failure to enable employees to be autonomous, high staff turnover and cynicism as to whether the organization really wants to change, senior leadership group not leading the change or not committed to change, little acknowledgement of the sustainability issues in the business goal supply chains, failure to acknowledge the human rights and social issues linked to global supply chains, inadequate systems to manage information, failure to keep up with technological innovations, not being able to form partnerships with civil society and to address ethical, social, and environmental issues, and finally, economic and financial priorities of businesses overshadow human sustainability issues.
Barriers to pro-environmental behavior are numerous factors that hinder individuals when they try to adjust their behaviors towards living more sustainable lifestyles. Generally, these barriers can be separated into larger categories, psychological, social, cultural, financial, and structural. Psychological barriers are considered internal where an individual's knowledge, beliefs, and thoughts affect their behavior. Social and cultural barriers are contextual where an individual's behavior is affected by their surroundings, such as their neighborhood, town, or city. Financial barriers are simply a lack of funds to move towards a sustainable behavior, such as new technologies or electric cars. Structural barriers, barriers are external and often impossible for an individual to control, such as lack of government action or locality of residence that promotes car use as opposed to public transit. A change agent, also known as an advocate of change, is a person who acts as a catalyst for the change management process. They help an organization or part of an organization transform how it operates by inspiring and influencing others. A change agent will promote, champion, enable, and support an organization's change implementation. Effective change agents are able to explore perspectives and take them into account when looking for solutions. This starts with listening. No one wants to feel that change is happening to them. People want to be emboldened to drive change and feel that others are listening to their ideas. Leaders who listen will develop stronger relationships with their people by gaining trust. This trust will help in getting buy-in for change. Promoting sustainability entails finding a balance between economic growth, social development, and environmental conservation. This requires an integrated approach that considers long-term impacts and recognizes interdependencies among these three critical dimensions of sustainable development. Ultimately, pursuing sustainability means striving for a future in which all people can thrive within healthy ecosystems while enjoying equitable opportunities for prosperity and well-being. This is because climate action plans must be drawn with long-term perspective that prioritizes the conservation of resources and ecological mediums. Here are six points on how individuals can effectively contribute to sustainability. Reduce energy consumption. According to the International Energy Agency, the building sector accounts for 28% of global greenhouse gas emissions. By reducing our energy consumption at home, we can significantly reduce our carbon footprint. This can be achieved by turning off lights and appliances when not in use, using energy efficient light bulbs and upgrading to energy efficiency appliances. Choose sustainable transportation. The transportation sector is responsible for 24% of global greenhouse gas emissions. By choosing sustainable models of transportation, such as cycling, walking, or using public transportation, we can significantly reduce our carbon footprint. According to the International Association of Public Transport, using public transportation can reduce carbon emissions by up to 37% per passenger compared to private cars. Reduce food waste. According to the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, one third of all food produced in the world is lost or wasted. By reducing food waste, we can not only reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also conserve resources such as water and land. This can be achieved by planning meals, buying only what you need, storing food properly, and composting food scraps. Using reusable products. Single-use products such as plastic bags and water bottles contribute to the accumulation of waste in landfills and oceans. By using reu reusable products such as cloth bags and water bottles, we can significantly reduce waste and conserve resources. According to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, by 2050 there could be more plastic in the oceans than fish if current trends can continue. Support sustainable businesses. By supporting environmentally conscious businesses, we can contribute to more sustainable economy. This can be achieved by buying products from companies that prioritize sustainability, such as those with environmentally friendly packaging or those that use renewable energy. And finally, educate ourselves and others. Education is crucial to promoting sustainability. 
by educating ourselves and others about the importance of sustainability and the actions we can take to promote it, we can create a more sustainable future. This can be achieved by reading books and articles about sustainability, attending sustainability events and conferences, and sharing information with friends and family. There are numerous stories of people taking on an environmental fight and winning. There are everyday individuals and celebrities, politicians and activists at the forefront, for, forefront of trying to spread the word of a sustainable future. Here are a few examples. Andrew Briggle was able to get fracking banned from Denton, Texas. Sandra Steingraber was able to protect the Finger Lakes region in upstate New York and ultimately was successful in banning fracking for the entire state. Simone and Jake Bernstein formed a website to help teens find volunteering opportunities. Jamie Romeo started a Lake Ontario beach cleanup effort with seven friends that grew into thousands taking part in cleaning up 26 miles of coastline and 10,000 pounds of trash. Virtually all household choices ranging from daily routines such as what we eat and how we get to work to less frequent decisions like how to heat our homes and whether to buy a car affect the climate and the environment. While the potential for individual and household choices to reduce environmental impacts is clear, the increasing urgency of climate change and other environmental crises illustrates the challenge governments face in fulfilling this potential. Environmental pressures from household consumption are significant. Without greater policy effort, their impacts are likely to intensify over the coming years as populations and disposable incomes grow. Availability, affordability, and convenience are key incentives for households to make environmentally sustainable choices. Policies should therefore seek to remove barriers to action related to these aspects while creating the right incentives to encourage uptake. Energy efficient upgrades for a home can net a high return on investment, boosting the home's value over time. Increasing a home's value can improve equity and generate a higher price point when selling. Upgrades that increase a home's energy efficiency may also lead to lower heating, cooling, and water bills. A social entrepreneur is a person who pursues novel applications that have the potential to solve community-based problems. These individuals are willing to take on the risk and effort to create positive changes in society through their initiatives. Social entrepreneurs may believe that this practice is a way to connect you to your life's purpose, help others find theirs, and make a difference in the world all while eking out a living. Widespread use of ethical practices such as impact investing, conscious consumerism, and corporate social responsibility programs facilitates the success of social entrepreneurs. A social entrepreneur is interested in starting a business for the greater social good and not just for the pursuit of profits. Social entrepreneurs may seek to produce environmentally friendly products, serve an underserved community, or focus on filth philanthropic activities. Social entrepreneurship is a growing trend alongside social responsibly investing and social, environmental social and governance investing. The four primary types of social entrepreneurs are community social entrepreneurs, nonprofit social entrepreneurs, transformational social entrepreneurs, and global social entrepreneurs. The main goal of a social entrepreneur is not to earn a profit. Rather, a social entrepreneur seeks to implement widespread improvements in society. However, a social entrepreneur must still be financially savvy to succeed in his or her cause. Social entrepreneurs design their thinking around the six P's of launching an idea. People, problem, plan, prioritize, prototype, and pursue. Let's look at those in a little bit more detail. People. Most social entrepreneurs start their endeavors by identifying what people they want to benefit. Sometimes this is the people in their specific geographic region. Other times this is people with a certain demographic, such as people with low income. 
Without a clear definition of who the social entrepreneur wants to serve, they will face difficulty in appropriately defining the scope of their enterprise. This puts the yet to be created entity at risk of not having a clear vision. Problem. Social entrepreneurs try to fix problems. More specifically, social entrepreneurs identify a problem that the people in the previous section face. Usually during the brainstorm phase of an entity, the social entrepreneur will link the two together. For example, social entrepreneurs may try to defeat homelessness in their region. Social entrepreneur in this situation tries to help certain people, such as low-income individuals, with a problem, the lack of available housing. Plan. <clears throat> with the people and problem identified, the social entrepreneur must devise a plan to solve the problem. Social entrepreneurs not only strive to create a business plan to operate an entity, they must also determine how this type of entity will receive funding and remain financially sustainable. The social entrepreneur must also evaluate how external parties can help it achieve its goals. Prioritize. One of the largest challenges facing social entrepreneurs is a lack of available resources to tackle the problem they wish to solve. This means not enough money, not enough specialized knowledge, or external forces that cannot be controlled. Social entrepreneurs face many constraints. This means they must prioritize what they try to solve, how they go about operating, and what expansion looks like. Prototype. Because resources are limited, social entrepreneurs often test out solutions in small markets before expanding. This means creating prototype products, services, or processes. It also tests out how different funding and resources can help it achieve, help it achieve its goals. Through this stage, though this stage may not foster trust in those who have provided an upfront investment with the social entrepreneur, other upfront investors may have appreciate seeing a minimum viable product or prototype. Pursue. With the test case down, social entrepreneurs identify what went well and what didn't go well. It often surveys those that helped out put the solution together as well as those receiving the benefit. This last step closes the full loop of activity through a social entrepreneur should periodical periodically evaluate each aspect and continually monitor for ways to make better their social change. Sustainable investing refers to a range of practices in which investors aim to achieve financial returns while promoting long-term environmental or social value. Combining traditional investment approaches with environment, social, and corporate governance insights has led to investors generating more comprehensive analyses and making better investment decisions. Sustainable investments ensures firms aren't judged solely on short-term financial gains, but on broader picture of what, what and how they contribute to society. Investors must think critically about investments' potential impacts as they relate to environmental, political, and societal landscapes. The concept of green investment is an outgrowth of the socially responsible investment, investing movement. Socially responsible investors often seek to avoid investing in companies that produce products such as alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Green investors seek to put their money into supporting companies that protect the environment. While the movement has taken a while to generate momentum, the outlook, the outlook looks bright as concerns about energy and the environment continue to mount. In addition to buying stock in environmentally friendly companies or companies engaged in efforts to solve environmental problems, you can also purchase their products. You'll get to enjoy the products themselves and every dollar you spend will support your investment. In a similar fashion, if you identify companies that operate in ways that are detrimental to the environment, you could choose to keep their stocks out of your portfolio and their products out of your home. An effective way to increase individual power is to work with others who share that same idea in social movements or organizations. Collective action refers to action taken together by a group of people whose goal is to enhance their condition and achieve a commonplace objective. Direct action refers to a group of individuals trying to reveal an existing problem and affect change by acts such as sit-ins, boycotts, and blockades. 
Direct action can sometimes do more harm than good by alienating key stakeholders that want to enact real change without casting a negative light on how it is handled. In most parts of the world, citizens have a right to select their local leaders who have the responsibility of implementing the community's will within the rule of law imposed by the local and higher level governments. Communities may be served by an elected board or council along with a mayor. In some cases, councils are appointed by a high order government authority. For example, in China, local leaders are often appointed by the central government. In some communities, the local elected leaders hire an administrator, such as a town or county executive, to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the community. Of course, there are many parts of the world today where local governance is very difficult due to political or social turmoil. These places are managed largely by external forces or warlords, and there is very little opportunity to make improvements on sustainability related issues in these such places. In some places, there are special purpose local governments that are organized for particular reasons. These may include school boards, sewer system boards, water boards, library boards, or public transit governance. All of the local government forms have some responsibility of ensuring the long-term sustainability of their community. They all work more or less with issues that fall within the three E's of sustainability, environment, economics, and equity. Citizen participation is crucial, crucial to the success of local governments. Their input is important to the day-to-day -day workings of local governments. Without participation, democratic traditions in local governments can break down. Plus, citizens have a responsibility to oversee government processes via participation in public meetings to ensure leaders do not misuse public funds or lands. One of the most important aspects about citizen participation in local governments is that the citizenry should be informed so that they make wise decisions on local issues and in voting for leaders. Thus, an educated public is an important aspect of a su successful local government. That is one of the reasons why so much attention is given to education in local communities. Plus, local governments have an obligation to ensure that they educate their citizens about key issues facing their community. In order to strengthen the environmental and social movements, we need to think about how to unite diverse communities on common issues so that we can work together, share resources and expertise, and take advantage of the power of numbers to generate solutions. Providing the poorest people access to the tools, choices, and processes so they can live their lives more sustainably must be a priority. Increased access to sustainable housing and home improvements should be made available to the poor. Increased access to sustainable food in poor areas. And finally, close the digital divide, access to technology in developing countries to help spread sustainable development. Smart growth brings together a series of principles of urban development. They seek practical and resolutive investment in infrastructures protecting open spaces, the economic prosperity of the population nuclei in which they are applied, and the involvement of the groups that make up the community. In this section, we'll take a look at smart growth and what it is, new urbanism and how it's related to smart growth, and relate regional sustainability. Smart growth envisions a reduction in the extension of low-density suburban subdivisions as the predominant pattern of development. New urbanism reflects a more pedestrian-orientated European style of urban life. Growth policies that target develop development towards urban infill and revitalization could result in the intensification of ethnic separation. The success of strategies carries the alternative image of gentrification and displacement of the poor. The smart growth movement represents a policy shift towards a more compact development as a break on urban sprawl. Simply stated, smart growth calls for public subsidies for growth, such as facilities and infrastructure subsidies being targeted at areas deemed appropriate for urbanization. Smart growth 
as compared to the first generation growth management enjoys widespread support both by public officials and the public who are concerned with traffic congestion as well as development of the community. Smart growth looks different from place to place. It's an overall approach to development that encourages a mix of buildings, types, and uses, diverse housing and transportation options, development within existing neighborhoods, and robust community management. Mixed landing, mixing land use means building homes, offices, schools, parks, shops, restaurants, and other types of development near one another on the same block or even within the same building. Mixed land uses bring more people to a neighborhood at a variety of times of day, which can support businesses, improve safety, and enhance the vitality of an area. Mixing land uses also makes it possible for people to live closer to where they work or run errands, and means they don't need to drive a car to get there. Mixed use neighborhoods are in demand meaning this approach can boost property values and keep them stable, protecting the investment of homeowners as well as tax revenues for municipalities. Compact design means making more efficient use of land that has already been developed. Encouraging development to grow up rather than out is one way to do this. Infill development, building on empty or underutilized lots is another. Building within an existing neighborhood can attract more people to the jobs, homes, and businesses already there while also making the most of public investments in things like water and sewer lines, roads, and emergency services. Building quality housing for families of all eight stages of, and income levels is an integral part of smart growth approach. Housing constitutes a significant share of new construction and development in any city, but its economic importance is sometimes overlooked. Adding housing in commercial districts can breathe new life into these neighborhoods in evenings and on weekends. And more importantly, the housing options available in a community will influence families' economic opportunities, cost of living, and how much time they spend commuting each day. Diversifying housing options within existing neighborhoods can give everyone more choices about where they live. Walkable neighborhoods are in high demand across the country and it's hardly a mystery why. Walking is a convenient, affordable, and healthy way to get around that never goes out of style so long as people can do it safely and conveniently. Walkable places are created in part by mixing land uses and taking advantage of compact design, but are activated by smart street design that makes walking not only practical, but safe and convenient to enjoy. Unique, interesting places that reflect the diverse values, culture, and heritage of the people who live there have a, the greatest staying power. Projects and neighborhoods that incorporate natural features, historic structures, public art, and placemaking can help distinguish a place from its neighbors to attract new residents and visitors and support a vibrant community for the people who are already there. Preserving open spaces like prairie, wetlands, parks, and farms is both an environmental issue and economic issue. People across the country want access to natural recreation areas, which translates into demand for housing and tourism. Meeting that demand improves the city's ability to attract employers while also supporting agricultural industries. Preserving open spaces can also make communities more resilient, protecting them from natural disasters, combating air pollution, controlling wind, providing erosion control, moderating temperatures, protecting water quality, and protecting animal and plant habitats. Finally, developing within existing communities rather than building on previously undeveloped land makes the most of the investments we've already made in roads, bridges, water pipes, and other infrastructure, while strengthening local tax bases and protecting open space. Regulations, zoning, and other public policies sometimes make this approach unnecessarily difficult for developers, however. Local leaders can and should change policy to encourage development within existing neighborhoods. 
New urbanism is a planning and development approach based on the principles of how cities and towns had been built for the last several centuries, walkable blocks and streets, housing and shopping in close proximity, and accessible public spaces. In other words, new urbanism focuses on human-scaled urban design. The, the principles were developed to offer alternatives to the sprawling, single-use, low-density patterns typical of post-World War II development, which have been shown to inflict negative economic, health, and environmental impacts on communities. These design and development principles can be applied to new development, urban infill and revitalization, and preservation. They can be applied to all scales of development in the full range of places, including rural main streets, booming suburban areas, urban neighborhoods, dense city centers, and even entire regions. New urbanists make place making and public space a high priority. New urbanist streets are designed for people rather than just cars and accommodate multimodal transportation, including walking, bicycling, transit use, and driving. Urbanists believe in providing plazas, squares, sidewalks, cafes, and porches to host daily interaction in public life. New urbanism is pragmatic. Great design is not useful if it can't be built. New urbanists work with and include production builders, small developers, traffic engineers, appraisers, and financial institutions, public officials, citizens, and others with influence over the built environment to come up with the Im implementable solutions. New urbanism is focused on design, which is critical to the function of communities. The size and shape of a plaza will help determine whether it's consistently alive with people or when swept and vacant. The organization of buildings in a neighborhood will help establish its character. Combining appropriate design elements makes places that are greater than the sum of their parts. New urbanism is holistic. All scales from the metropolitan region to the single building are related. A building that is connected to a transit stop will help the region function better and well-organized region benefits the building within it. Streets that rely on engineering tend to move automobiles and little else. All disciplines related to the built environment must work together to create great places. Reclaiming underutilized and neglected places is a special focus of new urban design and building. Through the federal HOPE 6 and Choice Neighborhoods programs, for example, new urbanism is transforming deteriorating public housing into livable mixed income neighborhoods. Commercial strips with single-use development excessive asphalt are transformed into lively main streets or boulevards through new urban design. Above all, new urbanism is about creating sustainable, human-scaled places where people can live healthy and happy lives. The walkable, vibrant, beautiful places that new urbanists build work better for businesses, local governments, and their residents. Anyone that works to create, restore, or protect a great place can join the new urbanist movement. The federal government subsidizes housing in many ways, but by far the largest is the income tax treatment of owner-occupied housing. The income tax subsidy is both misunderstood and overstated as an, a cause of sprawl. The chief subsidy to housing is not, as commonly asserted, the deduction of mortgage interest from taxable income. Most homeowners do not even itemize on their income tax forms, so deductibility means nothing to them. The benefit that all homeowners get is more subtle. They provide a service to themselves by managing their own property, and the government does not tax them on this income. They also do not have to pay capital gains on the sale of their homes. This makes an owner-occupied home an untaxed asset, which gives it a huge advantage over almost all other accessible investments. The major contributor to low-density development is the reluctance of suburban communities to accommodate higher density housing. Developers frustrated by the not-in-my-backyard or NIMBY approach 
opponents in the areas close to jobs, amenities, and urban infrastructure are pushed to more rural areas. The result is lower than efficient housing density in the desired areas and more housing in low density rural areas. Many people argue that the federal government's highway construction and tax policies contribute to sprawl by making people want to buy suburban housing, but neither of those is likely to be much of a contributor to the excessively low density housing patterns that characterize the suburbs of many of our metropolitan areas. The federal government has indeed funded highway construction that makes it easier for cities to spread out, but it is not clear if that that the states would not have used the same gas tax revenues to do it themselves if they had the opportunity. Regardless of who built the highways, however, most anti-sprawl arguments are premised on highway congestion. Their implication is, is that curling, curing sprawl will cure congestion. If people could be in, induced to live in high density areas, goes the argument, they would be eager to use newly built fixed rail mass transit to get to work. Traffic congestion is the result not of too many highways, but the, of the reluctance on the part of the public everywhere to allow officials to change charge congestion tolls for highway use. Until the public is willing to accept that urban highways should not be a free good, they will be subjective subject to excessive congestion regardless of how many or how few people there are in the urban areas. Putting people closer together by restricting suburban development would only make congestion worse. The proposition that congestion can be overcome by building urban rail systems would be laughable if it was not so common and costly. None of the urban rail systems built in the last 30 years in the United States has made more than a trivial dent in traffic congestion in its metropolitan area, despite rider subsidies that dwarf those for automobiles. The reason is easy to see. Commuters like the area, like the idea of rail transit mainly because they suppose that people in cars in front of them will ride the rails. Almost nobody with a car actually wants to use the train himself. While sustainability in every industry and sector is affected by corruption and bribery, there are specific industries in which corruption is particularly pre prevalent. When lucrative contracts are up for grabs, bribery, fraud, and embezzlement can plague large-scale infrastructure projects. Corruption in this area can lead to stolen money and major structural elements failing to be built or being built in a substandard dangerous manner. Corruption in public health sector leads to the depletion of national health budgets, which reduces government capacity to provide essential treatments while magnifying the risk of unsafe or ineffective products on the market. Illegal trade, corruption, and bribery in flora and fauna contribute to the rapid extinction of many of the planet's protected species. Corruption comes into play as traffickers often rely on bribery to move illegally captured plants and animals across international borders. Despite its ethical, legal, social, and environmental consequences, corruption continues to be a major issue around the world, especially in low-income and developing countries. Why is the culture of bribery and corruption perpetuated across the globe? Significant efforts are constantly being made in every government to improve infrastructure, healthcare, justice, and all elements of community development. Government officials are under a lot of pressure to move the needle quickly, often in an unreasonable and unrealistic timeline, placing them in a position to conduct corrupt behavior such as accepting or committing bribery. In the same way that governments and organizations are under pressure, financial disparity in low-income communities creates a monetary pressures for individuals. In low-income countries, bribery is, common, is a common method by which individuals gain extra funds to supplement their wages. While Western cultures tend to be led primary rule-based, other cultures have many elements of relationship-based exchanges. Mutual obligation is a significant part of government and transaction in many countries, which includes the commitment of bribery as well as loyalty to certain parties over others. 
anti-bribery and corruption initiatives have been increasingly aggressive, but they have resulted in very few official prosecutions. It is possible that with limited amount of legal action taking place after the enactment of new regulations, organizations and governments may struggle to take the legal ramifications of corrupt actions seriously. Culture-led development includes a range of non-monetized benefits, such as greater social inclusiveness and rootedness, resilience, innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship for individuals and communities, and the use of local resources, skills, and knowledge. Respecting and supporting cultural expressions contributes to the strengthening the social capital of a community and fosters trust in public institutions. Cultural factors also influence lifestyles, individual behavior, consumption patterns, values related to environmental stewardship, and our interaction with the natural environment. Local and indigenous knowledge systems and environmental management practices provide valuable insight and tools for tackling ecological challenges, preventing biodiversity loss, reducing land degradation, and mitigating the effects of, the effects of climate change. Culture-sensitive approaches have demonstrated concretely how one can you address both the economic and human rights dimensions of poverty at the same time, while providing solutions to complex development issues in an innovative and multi-sectoral manner. Indeed, culture has a transformative power on existing development approaches, helping to broaden the terms of the current developmental development debate and to make development much more relevant to the needs of people. Development interventions are responsive to the cultural context and the particularities of a place and community and advanced human-centered approach to development are most effective and likely to yield sustainable, inclusive, and equitable outcomes. Acknowledging and promoting respect for cultural diversity within a human right based approach can facilitate intercultural dialogue, prevent conflicts, and protect the rights of marginalized groups within and between nations, thus creating optimal conditions for achieving development goals. Culture, understood this way, makes development more sustainable.